Amendment. And we did that on May 28th. Um, the next step there, the green bullet point, that's the, the step we're on now. That's in, in progress. And so we are in that 30-day comment period. And so it runs until June 26th. Um, and so we um, opted to do town halls as an additional opportunity for people to provide comments directly to the Division of Developmental Disabilities. Um, but don't forget that if you um, want to, you can still submit written comments as well um, through June 26. So we, we are appreciative that you're joining us. Um, but if you know of folks who didn't get an opportunity or you yourself would like to, written comments are still um, appropriate as well. And then what's going to happen after that, so that black bullet point that's not yet started, that's the next step. So after this public comment period ends, the state then moves into the next steps of this work, which is to gather all the public comment, summarize it, and then respond to those comments as part of the waiver submission to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Once all of that is completed, we'll actually submit um, that entire waiver amendment to CMS for their review. Um, and so again, through this process, we're so grateful that you're willing to join us today. You know, we had another session Tuesday evening um, and it's wonderful to have this involvement because we wanna hear directly from people. Um, and so again, thank you for spending a little bit of your lunch with us today. So right now um, you, you likely have either reviewed or observed the waiver amendment on, the, on our website. You likely received emails about it. Of course, we're hosting the town halls this week to specifically share information and to get that feedback um, in real time as well. So next we're gonna talk a little bit about what's actually um, being proposed as changes to the Family Support 360 waiver. And so the first part of that amendment is around who can be an agency with choice vendor and also how the Division of Developmental Disabilities selects them. So specifically what's changing here is that um, the amendment changes the rules for who can be an agency with choice vendor. So agency with choice vendors must have five plus years of experience serving people with disabilities, and agency with choice vendors do not need to be a uh, family support coordinator providers. It also changes how the providers are selected. And so currently there is a process to review a request for proposal responses, but because we needed to move quickly, we did change that, that process. The next item of change is around how the state of South Dakota pays agency with choice and common law vendors. So specifically South Dakota will pay vendors every month at a set amount for each person in the program. And the waiver does confirm that these payments do not affect a person's budget. The proposed amendment also requires that the state have at least one provider for agency with choice and common law. So again, to summarize, this essentially means that um, the amendment allows a new vendor type to offer agency with choice in South Dakota, and that the Division of Developmental Disabilities can hire and pay a new vendor like Consumer Direct Care Network, which is the identified vendor that we're currently in contractual um, negotiations with. The last um, piece is that again, this, uh, this section of the proposed amendment essentially states that DD will have a vendor for agency with choice and common law. The next area of change proposed in the amendment explains how people can use services with other people who also receive Family Support 360 services. So specifically, it explains that you can use respite services uh, with people that you live with and it also explains that you can use companion care in groups up to five people. And in both cases, that should be reflected in the individual support plan. So essentially that means that the waiver amendment will allow um, participants to, to use respite with people that live in their home and companion services with other people.
The next area of proposed amendment is explaining how people can pay their employees. And so specifically what's changing is, um, again, around the agency with choice, that this adds a wage range for, for those who use agency with choice. This means that you would select the rate to pay your employees from within that range. Um, it does not change anything around the common law. Those wages must continue to be usual and customary. So that means that the waiver lets you decide how much to pay your employees um, and that the pay must be within the range. And so DD is working with um, a new vendor to help determine the range, but also it's important to note that we are reviewing data um, that we currently have, right? So a, a range exists now in the system. We're just reviewing the data to determine what that range is. Um, and so once we have that information, um, we'll be able to work with the new vendor to um, identify that. This isn't necessarily new, it's just formalizing that. And then for the common law component, the waiver allows you uh, to decide you know, what what to pay your employees. Again, that requirement um, around being usual and customary, that is, that is not new. That's also something that we have um, had in place as well. The next area um, that the amendment is helping to change and clarify is um, that people can get extra support through supported decision-making and authorized representatives. So essentially this proposed change in the waiver is to help confirm that you can use supported decision-making to help you self-direct. Um, supported decision-making means that you decide you can get whatever help you need to self-direct from family, friends, or other people that you trust um, in order to help make those decisions around your self-direction. This change also adds a new term, which is authorized representative. And this is someone that you would choose to actually make the decisions for you. This is a person that today we call the, a legal representative. And so the difference here is um, that the authorized representative makes the decisions for you and somebody that you identify as a supported decision maker supports you in the decisions that you make. So essentially this means that with this waiver amendment um, to this particular area, that the waiver will continue to let you self-direct your services in whatever supports that you need. The waiver will also continue to let you have someone you trust to direct services on your behalf. Um, and it also helps to clarify that family support coordinators will continue to play an important role in helping you and your family self-direct services. The next area here um, that is a, is a cleanup or a clarification, if you will, um, is around um, the grievance system. So specifically, it clarifies that there is information um, about a grievance system within the agency with choice. Um, this is in case you need help settling a dispute that you might have with one of your employees. It also updates the waiver to share that the Division of Developmental Disabilities has hired an experienced family member. This family member gives you information and assistance and support um, and will help you and your family uh, with any questions that you have around self-direction. Um, and and we've, ha we've had this staff, um, it's Ms. Carrie Geppert who's on today. Um, she's extremely knowledgeable um, and is a wonderful resource for families. Um, so we wanted to clarify that as well within the waiver amendment. Um, the last piece here is that it specifically calls out the important role that family support coordinators have in providing information and assistance. Um, again, we know that many families um, think very highly of their family support coordinator, and we do too. And we wanted to make sure that it was very clearly um, clarified in the waiver. And so that's the, the, the third piece, if you will, around this particular cleanup. Essentially, all this means that 
Um, there will be there will continue to be a grievance system if you need help resolving issues with employees that you have hired. It also um, just clarifies that on staff at the Division of Developmental Disabilities, we do have a family member who's experienced with self-direction who can help you. Um, and then lastly, it really clarifies that family support coordinators will continue to support you as you self-direct services. The next area is a new area. So we've been kind of talking about cleanup and clarification um, uh, as in the proposed amendment, but now we're moving into something new. So um, this particular update is adding a new type of provider that's called organized healthcare delivery system. This type of provider offers services such as nutritional supplements, specialized med medical adaptive equipment and supplies, specialized therapies and vehicle modifications. This clarification um, also explains that this type of vendor um, is a vendor that already provides at least one other Family Support 360 service. And this change actually um, is made to uh, match how the other waiver that we have in the Division of Developmental Disabilities works. This was a recent update that was made to the Choices waiver. Um, and so we're making that here as well. I want to be clear, though, that this this isn't necessarily new. So as families, you might not um, even notice a difference with this because this is already something that's available. These services are provided now, but they're provided through a subcontract. And this change allows it to be a, a single contract. And there is no more reason or there's no more requirement um, for uh, the subcontract that's been in place. So, again, you might not even know that that's kind of what happens behind the scenes. Um, but going forward, what this does is it makes it easier to have vendors who can offer these types of services um, because it, it opens up more uh, available vendors and options um, and creates more efficiencies within these, these uh, particular services within family support. So um, the organized healthcare delivery system is, is often a vendor who works with non-Medicaid providers like Amazon or maybe your local hardware store that gives you more access to goods and services. And again, this, this doesn't necessarily change um, how you receive it um, because again, you might not know that this has been occurring through a sub subcontract agreement, um, but it should make it more accessible um, and more efficient as well. The next area is really explaining the front door process um, and clarifying that. So specifically, this change describes the, the new process to enroll in Family Support 360 and to assess whether you meet the level of care. So somebody new coming into services. So with the front door process, this person submits the needed forms to the Department of Human Services um, and then the intake specialist with us at the Division of Developmental Disabilities reviews those forms and all that information and essentially screens the person that's applying uh, to make sure that they meet the level of care requirement for intellectual and developmental disability. And then that passes along this, the uh, screening to Medicaid to initiate the Medicaid eligibility. So right now, the eligibility process for um, DD services is, is kind of a, a two-part process. This, this change helps to streamline that and make it more efficient. Um, and so essentially this means that um, while both the Division of Developmental Disabilities and Medicaid have an important role in determining waiver eligibility, like overall waiver eligibility, Previously, we would have had to do our part entirely and then forward that on to Medicaid, um, which can take a bit of time, right? And so this proposed change helps to streamline that and make the overall eligibility review process faster for families. And so this will affect only new people that are applying to Family Support 360 services, and it will not change 
Um, there's an annual requirement um, to re-review that level of care on an annual basis. That won't change. But again, for new people that are applying to services, it should be a more efficient and effective process um, with this change. So what questions do you have for us? Any in the mentee poll? I'm gonna open up chat here real quick. Also, thank you all for putting in your information. It's great to see who's here today. Joey, I have a few questions in the chat, or sorry, oh, okay. mentee come in. Okay. The first question is, um, I believe unrelated to the waiver amendment specifically. Okay. The question is, can families start signing up for new agency with choice in August? So they are approved to start before August 31st. Yes. So once we get that contract signed with the identified vendor, we'll be releasing information with timelines. Um, and so, yes, the answer is, is yes. When that's all com completed, that is the, the process. And we will work very closely with your family support coordinator as well so that they're able to um, help you with that process in addition to the state. The next question is, do you know what the range is for rates? That's a great question. So um, we are still reviewing what the current uh, range is. So again, this already exists. What we're trying to do is identify what it is, right? We know that a range exists now. Um, and so through this process, we just want to confirm what that is um, in order to clarify it for the new vendor as well. Then there's a, a, another question about uh, rates that just came in. Okay. How will families be involved in determining rates? So um, the participant and their family help to identify, um, you know, the usual and customary, like a reasonable rate, depending on what that service is, right? So the example um, I like to give is, um, for a companion care service, that's typically not like an $80 an hour position, right? That would be unusual and not customary. And so um, families help to set um, the, the rate for their staff and for their employees. That won't change. Another rate question. And, and I think this might have just been answered, the rate range and family involvement, question mark. Oh, perfect. Yeah, no, I'll just clarify again. So again, families will continue to be involved in um, setting the, the rates for their employees. Um, the, the range that we're trying to identify is because we know we, we have a range across services. And so we're just trying to um, do a data review, essentially, to determine what that range is so that it can be defined. And then there are a couple of questions about group rates. Okay. Um, the first question is, does pay change if there is a respite provider providing care to more than one person in the home? Or do they get paid per person supported? Same question for companion care. Yeah, so that will, so that will be clarified as well. But what this change is making is, um, a clarification or a cleanup, if you will, to indicate that this is a way that that service can be provided. Like personal care is an individual service. We wouldn't expect that to, to ever occur in a group. Um, but companion care clarifying that, especially, um, you know, community with friends, like that you're likely doing that in a group. And so just clarifying what that looks like as part of waiver service definition. And then similarly, there's a question, will there be a range for um, hourly wage for providers taking up to five participants? Yeah, so what that looks like will be will be further clarified as, as part of that analysis as well. Zoe, this is Heidi at Lightscape. I okay. do have a question. <clears throat> I have a question about the, the respite care and uh, only providing respite care to those that live in the same household at the same time. This hasn't come up very often, but I have had it come up in the past where a respite care provider 
did provide respite care services for um, two individuals that were not living in the same household. I'm just curious, is there is there a reason why that is changing? So it's we're really clarifying that respite care is appropriate for people who live in the same home because respite care can also at times include um, other services. You know, I think about example of personal care. And so clarifying that that's appropriate in a group when um, it, it's a respite care who's providing services to, let's say, for example, um, maybe a family has two kiddos that receive family support services. They would be able to identify one single respite care provider um, for those two kiddos who can provide um, that respite care service at the same time. Sure. So I, I understand that, but I just want to make sure I understand a respite care provider could not provide respite care at the same time to two children that live in separate homes. With this change, that's correct. Okay. Any other questions? Shivani, are we seeing anything else in Menti? Yeah, there is um, one clarification. Uh, somebody asked, no, will families be involved in identifying the range? Yes, um, they are now, right? So like I said, we have a range in the system, right? So one person might pay um, $17 for a service for their employee and somebody else might pay 19 right? So we already have a range in the system based off of what the pay rate has been set by that participant and their family. And that the act of setting the, the rate will not change. We're just simply identifying what the range is that, for that service. I hope that helped answer the question. Any other questions? All right, well, we, I'll just wait if somebody has a question or if you think of one, um, I am happy to, to stay on the line. If you need to drop off, that is okay, but we will stay on um, in case there was additional questions. Shabani, are we seeing anything else in Menti? I'm not seeing anything in chat. Okay. Nothing new in Menti. Thank okay. you. Looks like we just got a chat. I see the question, would families have able to use group daycare situations like here for youth for respite care? I'm not exactly sure what that is, Nikki. So we'll note that question and follow up. I'm just gonna add a comment to Nikki's question because I think I can clarify it. That, that is paid by an invoice instead of through the agency with choice or the okay, company. Thank you, Heidi. I think my confusion is daycare when respite is an intermittent service. 
that's what I'm referring to that I'll need to clarify. I need to just review that and can follow up. Hi, that's just what I called it, but the families that I work with do not even live in Sioux Falls, so they just use it intermittently for respite care situations when there are other things in Sioux Falls. So it, it would it's not a daycare situation, a daycare service that they're using. They're using it as respite care, but it's a group service. You know, there's many kids there, not just their kids. Thanks, Nikki. Yeah, we'll follow up on that that question. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, and then I see a question from a couple folks. Is Consumer Direct Care Network the only agency that family support coordinators oversee a participant's plan, budget, and help with state expenses? I am not sure that I understand the question. So I will say that family support coordinators positions um, are not changing that will continue to be focused on the provision of service, identifying the individual support plan. Um, that does not change. Again, consumer direct care is an employment service. So it's um, consumer direct care is an employment service for um, families who have chosen to self-direct um, specific services within the Family Support 360 waiver. And those services are personal care, respite care, companion care, and individual supported employment. So with the change in agency with choice vendor, we're taking the feedback that we've received over the last several weeks to months to help really carve out um, the, you know, what what that service looks like for us, right? Really working to um, design that in a way that makes sense for how our system works. So the question around, will coordinators oversee plans? Yes. Um, and will that also includes, um, you know, budgets around that as well as other uh, state expenses that, because again, it's all tied to the individual support plan. So Josh, I hope I helped answer that. Please let me know if I did not. Um, the next question is, I missed the beginning. Are we still able to pick our own provider to do respite care? Yes, you are still able to identify the employees that you would like to have provide um, any one of those four services. Any other questions? Are good questions. All right. Again, not hearing anything right now, but we will pause and stay on the line in case um, anyone has a question that comes to them. Nothing coming in the chat either, Joey. All right, thanks, Shivani. I think we'll wait maybe just another minute and then we'll go ahead and and in the town hall. All right, well, 
again, we greatly appreciate you spending a little time with us today and your willingness to share feedback on the Family Support 360 uh, proposed amendment. Uh, as a next step, again, the comment period is open until the 26th. Um, so please feel free to also send any written comments that you would like, encourage others to as well. Um, and then as a reminder, the next steps then is the state gathers that um, and includes that comment and the state's um, response to that in the, um, um, the amendment that gets submitted to the Centers for Medicaid or in Medicaid Services. So we got a little bit of time. Um, then it's about 90 days. So um, we will provide updates along the process as we have them. But again, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate your willingness to share feedback with us.